Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our lecture series again, and from many of you again. Uh, welcome to our session today, which will be on land issues, fire and haze. Uh, and today's speaker, Helena Wacke, who will be later introduced by Antonia. She is from the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, working there at the Department on, of International and Strategic Studies. I'm Christoph Anpar, I'm an anthropologist, and I will now shortly explain the context of this uh, lecture series. We call it Climate Controversy uh, Series. Uh, we want to combine uh, science and engage activism on anthropogenic uh, climate change, and especially on the contested issues about that. The whole uh, series is organized by the, uni the University of Bonn, especially our Department of Southeast Asian Studies, which is concentrated on contemporary Southeast Asian studies. And um, other partners, uh, important partners, are the ASEAN House, A Asia House in Cologne, where I'm sitting now. I mean, in Cologne, I'm sitting now. And especially the Philippine section. And um, also included and in the organization were the Fridays for Future and the Students for Future. And you see, um, we had a lecture, an introductory um, lecture by Philip Hirsch, uh, who set the whole um, framework, uh, ecological and uh, geoscientific uh, framework. Then we had a, a, a contribution on the Mekong Delta from Vietnam. We tried to uh, include many people who are really living in these countries and having studies these countries. And um, then we had uh, on uh, in November elections on storms, typhoon. You see that there the climate um, uh, topic came heavily in, as well as in the lecture on carbon, calcium carbon calamity. And then we had a, a lecture on um, gender struggles and of coal in Indonesia, where the gender issue was um, brought together with uh, environmental issues, and now. We have our topic today uh, uh, by our speaker, Dr. and her full name is Dr. Helena Binti Muhammad Barki um, from Malaysia. And she will be introduced uh, by Antonia. And I would like to say Selamat Petang, it was Sudalevat Malam, already evening in KL. Saya harap awak dalam keadaan baik dan terima kasih atas penyertaan Anda. And uh, now, Saya Serakan Kepada Antonia for the content part on you. Okay, Antonia. Okay. Please. Hello, everyone from my side as well. I'm kind of sad that I'm not able to understand the Indonesian, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was But, Malaysian. <laughs> okay, Malaysian. I'm sad I'm not even able to tell them apart, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> Well, um, my name is Antonia Engel and I'm a student at the Department of Southeast Asian or Asian Studies at the Bonn University. Um, as Professor Dr. Anweiler already said, the topic for this evening's lecture will be land use change, fires and hate in Southeast Asia. And Dr. Helena Varki, our speaker tonight, is, as already mentioned, a senior lecturer at the Department of International and Strategic Studies at the University of Malaya in Malaysia. And she completed her doctorate at the University of Sydney at the Department of Government and International Relations. Her research focuses on the governance of transboundary pollution or haze in Southeast Asia. And she seeks to understand how economic development can be reconciled with environmental sustainability. Some of her publications include 2018's The Crime of Haze, Politics of Land, Nature and Human Rights, and the haze problem in Southeast Asia, Palmer and Patronage in 2016. Thank you, Dr. Rocky, for giving us a little of your time, especially because we already know it is already quite late in Malaysia. Before I hand over to you, I would, yeah. Before I hand over to you, Dr. Rocky, I would like to explain how the lecture works very briefly. This lecture will last for about 30 minutes. And after that, we will have roughly another 30 minutes time for a question and answer session and a discussion. And seeing that we are a mix of students, audience and co-organizers, I would like to say that anyone is free to ask a question and all questions are appreciated. And of course, if you don't want to be recorded, your voice or your face, you can also post your question in the chat and then I will read it to Dr. Rocky. Now, without further ado, Dr. Varki, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, uh, Antonia, and also the organizing committee for having me. And uh, I will try my best to deliver a, a, a talk um, legibly since uh, it's a bit late here. So this is a first for me. Uh, I will try my best on my side. Uh, so I will go straight into it. Let me just uh, share my screen. Just give me one second to do that. Okay, so please let me know if it's not visible or anything. I think it should be okay. Um, yes, so uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I have been doing research on this area for quite some time now, more than 10 years, I think. Um, and uh, the, my entry point is sort of um, political economy and also sort of political geography. Uh, my background is international relations. Um, and all of this, my interest here came about actually originating from uh, this sort of puzzle that I found uh, between Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia in trying to resolve the Hayes issue. So it was very much an international relations problem, which I started out from. And this has expanded very much into a lot of other areas as well. And at the moment, I look into Hayes, I look into palm oil politics, um, agribusiness, um, all these kind of things. So thanks again for joining me today. I will be speaking about land use change, fires, and haze in Southeast Asia very generally. Um, so happy to go into more details of anything um, in during the Q&A. And I will also try my best to keep to the time allocated. So um, some of you may have experienced haze before. Some of you may have not. Some of you may have even been in the region um, uh, Malaysian haze, Singaporean haze, Indonesian haze. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I will just talk you through a bit. Um, actually, the, the term haze is, 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 is kind of interesting because if you look in the dictionary, the term haze uh, defines a natural occurrence. So it's a hazy atmosphere. So it means like the air gives off some sort of a blurness in the atmosphere. Um, but interestingly, in Southeast Asia, the term haze has been adopted to address something that is obviously not very natural. It is addressing air pollution and fires, uh, smoke from fires. Uh, this, uh, the reason for this kind of originates from the fact that, yeah, you know, when, it, when, when we began discussing haze as a Southeast Asian problem, um, ASEAN was the or organization which handled it at the, at the regional level. And we there was no sort of an agreement over what term to use. So for example, in Malaysia, we say um, jerabu, uh, our Malay word for haze. And in Indonesia, we say asap. Uh, so it's different. So we had to find a, a word that we could agree upon. And haze was sort of the thing that was agreed upon. And we could also say that there was a reluctance to overly focus on the human element. So that would have also been why this sort of natural phenomenon kind of term was used. So anyway, it's a smoke, it's a type of smoke pollution um, originating mainly from fires. Um, and I'll go into a bit into the types of fires. And uh, we have the fires in uh, Indonesia, uh, lesser extent in Malaysia. We also have increasingly fires now in Thailand and in the Golden Triangle area as well. But the fires that I will talk to you about today is mainly in the maritime Southeast Asian region, so mainly Indonesia and, and Malaysia and, and how it affects this part of the region. So obviously, um, haze can be localized. Uh, so the fires in Indonesia are usually very localized, uh, but sometimes they, be, they travel across borders and they become transboundary. Um, and when it's really, really bad, it can affect up to eight ASEAN states. So the fires originating in Indonesia and, and, and Malaysia sometimes, but usually it's Indonesia. Because uh, Malaysian fires uh, usually don't go transboundary. They usually just end up in the South China Sea. Um, so uh, it can affect up to eight ASEAN states. So that's why it's very much of an ASEAN problem in that sense. And it has been a problem since at least 1983. Uh, this was the first mention of the problem of transboundary haze in the newspapers, which I was able to find during my research. 
Um, and uh, the main countries affected are usually Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Um, and depending on the weather at the time, uh, it will go beyond that. Uh, haze is, 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 is um, originating from fires, but it's also very much linked to weather. I mean, the extent of the transboundariness of haze is very much in linked to weather. So for example, uh, last year, there was a weak El Nino season, so it was not very dry and the winds uh, were not very strong. And therefore, the, uh, and the direction of the wind as well did not really bring anything uh, much to, to Malaysia and Singapore, even though there were fires occurring uh, in Indonesia. So we, uh, El Nino works in a cycle, so we might see next year or the year after a strong, a strong El Nino, and that will be, the risk will be very high for another transboundary event. The previous, uh, before 2019, 2019 was quite bad. Before that, it was 2015. So it's about four, three, four years kind of a cycle. Um, and uh, how it affects us in the region, of course, we always must remember that in Indonesia is much, much more worse than anything that Malaysia and Singapore would experience. Uh, but wherever haze occurs, uh, it causes serious socioeconomic and environmental problems uh, in these areas. So there's been some really interesting research coming out from various places that have tried to estimate um, the, the deaths that has been linked to haze. Um, and two separate papers, uh, looking at the 2015 episode, which was quite bad, which I, was what I mentioned earlier, uh, range from about 40,000 to 100,000 additional deaths in the region, meaning that uh, people who were already sick, they became more sick because of haze, and then that led to their deaths. Or people began to get sick during the haze season, and eventually they succumbed to their sickness that originated during the haze, I mean, linked to haze and various other calculations. Um, this is actually something quite interesting because if you look at the official country reports on how many people actually died, you will have, I would say, ridiculously low numbers. So for example, Malaysia had said that there was no deaths caused by the haze in this year. Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken, said there were 19 deaths, one nine. So this is a very, I mean, it is very different from this sort of estimate. So of course, the, the, the formal figures would be really directly haze, clearly haze related and also happening during the peak haze season. But this kind of figures, uh, the, the more academic figures gives us more of a, a view of the magnitude of this problem actually. Um, other than that, you know, social uh, economically, we have lost man hours when people cannot go to work or people get sick, they have to stay home. There's definitely terrible drops in tourism. And this is, of course, pre-COVID when we actually had tourism. Um, so uh, we would have, I mean, hay season would be the season where there's always a slump in tourism. People wouldn't want to come to this part of the world. And this is problematic because, of course, Southeast Asia is very much dependent on tourism. Um, firefighting costs go up for each of the countries uh, involved, uh, and as well as you know, additional health costs, not only for the government, but also for the public. They have to spend more money on unscheduled hospital visits, on pharmacy um, medicines, and all this kind of stuff. Um, nature, in, in terms of uh, the natural uh, world, uh, reduces photosynthesis. So there is a reduction, not only in, um, uh, how to say, uh, the health of our ecosystems, but as well as crops. Crops have failed during very bad hay seasons as well because they don't get enough sunlight. Uh, we also have emergencies, uh, school, schools will close. Uh, sometimes we have also been in, uh, instructed to, to, you know, don't go out of the house. Uh, we have had emergencies declared where uh, even, uh, even uh, all businesses are, are shut down as well. Uh, a few times this has happened. Of course, the worst affected is always Indonesia. Um, just to put a bit in context, uh, during 2015 haze, um, in uh, Malaysia, uh, 20, sorry, 2019 haze, the worst areas in Malaysia, our, our fire, I mean, our haze index, which we call the API, uh, was about 200 plus. But in Indonesia, it was 2000. So you can see the severity, definitely whatever we experience, Indonesia experiences much more worse, especially really close to the fires. So um, in Indonesia, uh, 2015, they managed to calculate that about 16 billion of losses was incurred linked to the haze, and that's about 2% of their GDP. So this is quite um, drastic uh, uh, effect on the economy. 
So how does this all link into uh, with climate change, right? So one of the really important things that we have to understand about the fires in Southeast Asia is its connection to peatlands. Uh, so I'll talk to you about peatlands first and then I'll tell you how they are linked. Uh, peatlands in Southeast Asia are about 60% of the world's tropical peatlands and 70% of this is in Indonesia. The second largest is in Malaysia. Um, and peatlands are actually a very, very important carbon sink and it's, one in, and it's the most important land-based carbon sink. Another big carbon sink is the oceans. So a carbon sink is when carbon is locked into the, this area for, for, for certain reasons. So for the case of peatlands, um, the carbon debris, which is all the plants and the trees and the leaves that you see in the picture here, um, they, they fall into the black water, the water at the bottom, which you can see. So basically peatlands, are, they are flooded like this. And this water is sort of the magical uh, ingredient. So when all of the carbon-based debris falls into the water, they, um, of course, they sink eventually. And because they're not exposed to the oxygen, decomposition is halted. So the carbon is stuck in this state where it's not decomposing. And this eventually gets built up. They build up layer by layer over hundreds of thousands of years. And they are just there for perpetuity. And this is what is the peat layer is very carbon rich and it's, it's locked away. Um, and it's a very, very precious source of um, carbon. And uh, if it is disturbed, uh, drained, for example, when you want to use it for agriculture, first thing you must do is you have to drain it because it's too wet otherwise. Um, this organic matter is exposed, this really carbon rich matter is exposed and the decomposition process starts and this is what will then release all of this carbon that has been locked up for so long into the atmosphere. So it's a reversal of this carbon sink process. And this is basically irreversible. Once you drain the peatlands, this process starts, the decomposition starts, and even if you re-wet um, the whole area, you re-flood the whole area, you cannot retrieve again the carbon that has been released. Uh, so in that way, um, you know, once a peatland is disturbed, um, this is irreversible. It cannot be restored again. Whatever carbon that has been there has is basically uh, gone, and we have to start all over again from, from, from square one. So now, what is the link between peat fires and haze? So there are various types of for, uh, forests that burn during the dry season. The fires don't only occur on peatlands. However, the fires on peatlands actually produce the thickest, the hardiest smoke that can really travel far distances. And if you see the picture that I've put here, you can actually see that you can't see any fire. The thing with peat is because of the carbon rich soil, the fire is usually underground and this is why you can't see the fire and this is why the fire produces this type of smoke because it's so such a rich um, uh, biomass that is burning and the smoke they produce is so thick and um, and this is the one uh, that causes a majority of the haze. So even though there are not as many fires on peatlands but the smoke they produce are so much higher uh, and, and I've seen figures, I think like 80% of the haze is originates from fires in peatlands, even though there are fires elsewhere. Um, so actually natural fires in pristine peatlands are rare because you have seen the water just now like I showed you in the previous slide, uh, because it's impossible to, to almost impossible to catch fire when it's so wet. But as soon as peatlands are drained, they dry out really quickly. And this makes it really, um, fire prone. So peat fires can either occur accidentally due to the dry conditions or intentionally. Uh, and it is intentional when um, they use fire and people use fire as a tool to cheaply and easily clear the land after you've drained it. If you want to use it for agriculture, you have to clear it also because you can see in the picture, there's still a lot of bracken and all that that needs to be cleared. And uh, fire is one of the best and fastest and cheapest ways to do that. Fires can spread very quickly underground. So they are making, uh, and, and this makes it very hard to put out. So number one, you can't even see where the fires are burning. So it's hard to pinpoint where you should be pointing that hose. And uh, number two, since it's underground, basically the whole, the whole, um, the whole uh, area can be on fire and you don't know actually. So, the only way to put out if a, a peat fire effectively is to actually drown, um, uh, drown or flood the whole area. And this, is, this can be challenging when there is no water source during the dry season. 
um, and also peak areas are usually very far away from from cities and from urban areas and from even from villages sometimes usually actually uh, so it water sources you know through hoses and all that can be difficult to to to, to get so fire basically accelerates carbon release in peatland. So I told you before that as soon as it's drained, this process starts and the carbon gets released slowly. I mean, quick, quickly compared to how long it took to accumulate, but more slowly compared to when it's on fire. When the peatlands are on fire, um, this really super accelerates the carbon release in these areas. And this is why we have uh, countries like Indonesia coming up quite high in the list of uh, uh, carbon emitters in the world not because of industrialization and all this, uh, which is what you know, China and US all would be high on the list for. But Indonesia, I think a few years back, they were actually top three um, in the list uh, of, of emitters. And this was linked to the huge fires that were occurring that year in areas uh, like this, in peat areas, which are very carbon rich. So this, of course, upsets the carbon balance and it contributes to um, climate change as well. So this is a very important concern for this part of the world. If we want to control, do our part in controlling um, climate change. So what are the drivers of this drainage, peatland drainage? So I've talked to you about how agriculture, um, uh, I mean, if you, want to, if you want to use peatlands for agriculture, you would have to drain the area. Um, so forest fires uh, in peatlands are often linked to either to small scale slash and burn, but uh, or rather they are usually conveniently linked to small scale slash and burn. But um, more and more we have seen that larger fires uh, can be associated with commercial agribusiness activity. Most popularly is palm oil and pulpwood. Um, so what happens is that uh, palm oil or pulpwood, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, concessions when they want to open up, uh, they would have to drain this area as well. And uh, if they use fire, or if, even if they don't use fire, the very fact that they are draining these huge areas uh, leave it very vulnerable to, uh, to haze, um, uh, uh, to fires, like, basically. So one of the things that we, 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 we have found uh, very, uh, a very clear link, or rather a very clear trend, is that the worst fires and haze in Southeast Asia has been linked to the palm oil boom in the late 1990s. Our worst haze was in 1997, and that was the same time that palm oil really became a big thing in this part of the world, and uh, huge areas were being drained for this purpose. Um, so this is how uh, peatland is uh, looks like when it has been converted to palm oil. So you can see these drains, right? So these are basically big ditches. And these ditches are dug so that the water flows into these ditches and are brought away and are flowing away. And, and this is how it basically looks like. Uh, so the left and right banks, they are basically exposed peat and um, they are able to plant palm oil and other things, palm and paper, and also some other things as well on it. Usually peatlands are unsuitable for agriculture um, because as, I've, as I pointed out, they are usually wet. And because you need to do all this drainage and the land clearing and all that, it can be very expensive to prepare as well. Um, the peat soils are usually lacking in nutrients that are usually needed for, for agriculture and they are also considered infertile. So um, you would think that if all of these problems, why do people even use or want to use peatlands if they're so if it's so problematic anyway? However, there is there has still been a high demand for peats uh, for peatlands uh, because of the limited uh, mineral soil that's around that is unencumbered. One of the big reasons for this is if if it's mineral soil or if it's regular soil, usually they will have a lot of um, communities living on them, uh, villages living on them. However, compared to peatlands, peatlands, um, people do go in for like fishing and sort of collection of materials and of uh, animals, hunting and all that. But they don't usually stay in there because it's quite impossible to stay in these kind of conditions as you have seen the picture. So um, just in terms of like um, if a company wants to, wants to um, claim a land, um, it would be more convenient because you won't have to worry about giving compensation, won't have to worry about community conflicts so much. So peatlands are usually quite unencumbered compared to mineral soil. Other things is, uh, you know, palm oil and other and also certain pulp trees um, are, do grow well 
in peatlands. Uh, for example, palm oil, they can actually stand being waterlogged. Uh, not all plants can do that. If there's too much water in the soil, they can't, they can't last, but palm oil can. So it is particularly suitable for this kind of, uh, this kind of um, soil. Uh, there's also usually a lot of valuable timber that can be that that, that are on the peatlands. Um, you know things like hardwood, ramen, all these kinds of. You may have heard of this. Um, they grow very well on peatlands. So this is like startup capital, excellent startup capital for for uh, developers. Uh, I mean for investors, they can basically log the place and sell all of this valuable uh, hardwood, and that could be the startup capital to cover for the expensive costs that they would have to put into. So it kind of balances each other out. I've also mentioned about the emptiness of native populations. Um, I've also mentioned that point uh, on, on the expensive prep. Uh, prep. Um, and also peatlands are usually in secluded areas. So they are quite far from scrutiny. So things can be done quite easily uh, without anybody sort of breathing down your backs. So this is why peatlands, despite being so problematic, um, has been very popular um, in, in, uh, for, for this kind of uh, agriculture, agribusiness development, I would say. So actually, by right, uh, peatlands are quite well protected under law in Indonesia, in Malaysia. You know? So these are some of the uh, varieties of laws that exist uh, that actually limits the uh, access of uh, people and also of companies uh, to land that is considered peatlands. Uh, so I won't read it out, but just, just to show that, you know, peatlands are actually in many ways protected under the, um, under the legislation because there is an awareness that these areas are very important, you know, biodiverse. Uh, they have a very important role to play in the ecosystem uh, services. Um, however, uh, you know, this is something that uh, is on paper and it sometimes doesn't get translated very well uh, in, 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 in real life. So um, through my research, uh, I asked the question, like, if you have all of these laws in place, um, why is this still occurring? So what is the problem here? So uh, I found uh, patron the patronage uh, uh, I guess patronage uh, framework, a very useful framework to understand for myself to understand what is happening. So uh, if I can just define what is patron client relationships a bit, just for the benefit of those who may not be familiar, it is a mutually symbiotic relationship between individuals in which one with the higher socioeconomic power is called patron, uh, exercises their influence and resources to provide for the other person uh, of lower status, uh, which is the client, in exchange for support, assistance, and services. So uh, usually what happens here is that um, the patrons are usually in the government. They can be local uh, leaders, bupatis, for example, or police chiefs, um, and uh, or can, they can even be central uh, uh, officials, right? Uh, and the clients are usually the companies, uh, and the, may, maybe they are medium-sized, they are large, they can be multinationals, they can be local companies, right? but they are basically the, 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 the clients. And it's a mutually supportive relationship. The patron provides preferential treatment to the client and the client benefits. And in return, the client helps the patron achieve their political um, goals. Uh, for example, either votes or development in the region or monetary kickbacks, personal monetary kickbacks. So in this case, what has happened is that uh, even though peatlands are not supposed to have been given out this way, but these uh, patrons have been able to give out these lands through various ways, either through sidestepping certain requirements or by changing certain statutes on the local level, um, so that certain uh, clients are able to get access to these peatlands. So for example, things like the AMDAL, which is the EIA, um, are often not carried out. Um, and, you know, and this has been just um, sort of glossed over. Uh, if an EIA had been carried out, of course, these lands would not have been um, uh, available for, license, for, for licensing. So um, this is a very common business culture in Indonesia. And I will also say very common in the region as well. And um, if you do not partake in this business culture, it is very difficult to do business actually in Indonesia. So it's almost sort of like a given. So everybody is involved. So it's systemic in that way. So 
because the patrons will help their clients get easy access to peatlands through their licensing, or that would say maybe you can call it creative licensing. Um, this has caused the presence of these uh, of these organ of these uh, of these uh, companies uh, and also uh, I mean in peatlands. And of course, when companies come into peatlands, they build roads and all that. And also, this also uh, brings along with them other smallholders as well because the access is already open as well. So it is sort of like a, a rolling stone where all this is happening one after the other. And then um, uh, what uh, the, as a result of this really close relationship, companies become very um, powerful in that way. So they are not afraid of laws because they know that they are being protected uh, by their uh, patrons. So governments will protect their clients because their own interests are at stake. Governments have, or rather the, 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 the patrons have an interest to make sure their clients are able to continue doing what they do. Um, so uh, what happens is that even when a fire does occur, uh, there's always, uh, I mean, or, uh, first of all, there is a lax enforcement of fire law. So even when there is a fire, very rarely does an investigation actually occur, uh, or rather very rarely does any action being taken. And um, even when there is any investigation or anything like that, um, usually it will not end up in court. And uh, even if it does end up in court, it will end up being thrown out. So it's very rare that a fire case or a case of a company uh, found guilty for uh, causing fires and causing haze um, really are punished at the end. Um, so, and, and also there's this sort of a protective relationship, for example, governments are very reluctant to release the names of the companies who are actually involved, um, because it's, it's, it's this whole systemic culture, you know, and this creates also a culture of impunity where um, uh, law is basically meaningless. And as a result of this, um, we see that actually, I mean, these figures are, 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 are a bit old, but we have not been able to find any more recent uh, figures, but it's still quite representative in the sense that um, about one quarter of all peatlands, uh, of all plantations are on peat uh, in Indonesia and uh, quite a big number as well in Malaysia. And this of course should not happen if the law is being followed, where right? you're not supposed to be on peat in the first place. So, as you see, of course, uh, peat does not make up the majority of the land uh, used for palm oil, but the impact of peat is severe, both in terms of climate change and fire and, and haze as well, which is why we are so concerned about this. And um, I think I mentioned this before, but I'll just say it again, even though concessions do not intentionally light fires to clear land, the process of them draining it can lead to fires, uh, in, uh, indirectly lead to fires because it dries up the land. Um, and also one of the important things that I think is increasingly, people are increasingly realizing is that um, when concessions are given out on peatlands, um, because of the nature of peatlands, which are usually like a peat dome, which means it's like a bowl. So if, um, imagine a, a glass of, uh, I mean, a bowl of water, if you drain one part of that bowl, if you, if you prick a hole in one part of that bowl, um, the whole bowl, the whole uh, level of water in that bowl goes lower not just one part. So it's the same thing with peatlands. If a com company is given part of a peatland uh, to develop, uh, they may put all of the measures that they can, you know, to keep, make sure that their part is remain safe and fire-free and all that. But the fact that they are draining their part of the peatland would dry out other parts as well. And this is why we always have adjacent fires just outside concessions uh, because of the actions of the of the plantations actually because they are drying out and this affects the whole ecosystem uh, so this also complicates um, uh, legal recourse because it's not technically on their land but they are indirectly involved in that way um, so this is what is uh, sort of the the uh, complexity of the issues uh, here so in terms of regional haze governance, uh, haze has been a priority environmental issue since 1985 in ASEAN, which I mentioned before. Um, there's been a variety of mechanisms and other efforts, but the most notable is the 2003 Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution. Uh, so we had an agreement that uh, basically uh, was agreed upon by all the countries, which is quite a great achievement considering that um, the complexity of this issue. 
is basically the first legally binding document in uh, environmental document in ASEAN actually. ASEAN does not usually go for legally binding documents. However, it is weak and watered down um, uh, largely because of the ASEAN way commitment. Uh, I hope that uh, most of you may be familiar with this, but basically the ASEAN way is about non-interference, non-legalistic approach, non-legally binding stuff. Uh, so because of that, you know, the agreement was weak, watered down to get consensus, uh, no concrete commitments and no enforcement mechanisms or dispute settlement procedures. So even though the instrument is there and is legally binding, however, the operationalization was very limited. And Indonesia, which is sort of the crux of the, of the issue, only ratified in 2014. So this also caused quite a bit of delay um, in the whole process of adoption and, and operationalization. So, and, and one of the sort of side stories which I like to think about is that the ASEAN's priority has always been economic development. And one of the engines of economic development very prominent in this part of the world is agribusiness and is, um, it is uh, natural resources. So it's always a bit tricky when you're trying to sort of limit the access and limit the freedom of these nations um, to exploit, right, their, their land and and this is seen as a threat to economic development. So it's, it's basically because of all of these reasons, haze is a very complex multidimensional issue. It's not just about you know, managing fire. It's not just a simple um, pollution issue in that sense. So uh, as I've said before, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia is the worst affected. Um, but a lot of agricultural land in Indonesia, which is also have been found to be implicated in fires, have been linked to Malaysian and also Singaporean interests. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, foreign investment from these two countries into Indonesia, especially for palm oil as well, because Malaysia is known as one of the experts of palm oil um, and Singapore as well for, for refining and all this kind of stuff. So they were very interested in getting land in Indonesia to further expand their businesses about 1990s onwards. And many of the uh, foreign companies as well has benefited from the patronage uh, system in Indonesia. So just because you are non-Indonesian, um, it did not mean that you, can, you, you, you do not have to engage in patron-client relations. You do have to still, like I said, it's very hard to do business if you do not. Um, so um, there's, also some, there's also a form of regional patronage that I have found where Malaysian and Singaporean companies are protected by their, by their patrons back home. Sorry, that that's a typo over there. Uh, so it means that, you know, when there's a Malaysian company who has been identified by the Indonesian government to have caused some fire, the Malaysian government will be very interested in protecting their interests and claiming that they have done nothing wrong, even before any substantial um, evidence or investigation. So there's also that sort of regional patronage involved, which is adding to the complexity of it all. And of course, Malaysia and Singapore, because of these reasons, cannot force and coerce Indonesia to do, to you know, be more serious or to do something extra to, uh, about the haze, um, simply because Indonesia will always point, point fingers back at them saying that, you know, it's your companies as well. It's not just our fault. So it kind of ends up usually in a deadlock. And this really um, uh, affects diplomatic relations quite severely. Um, and it's kind of like um, not really in the spirit of the ASEAN way where you're supposed to be like friendly, neighborly. So if, if let's say Malaysia sort of calls out Indonesia is viewed as something not very ASEAN thing to do. So it does damage relations that way. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just go through each country to just tell what have been the sort of the latest developments. So I'm gonna start with Singapore, uh, basically latest developments on haze. So I, if you see here, this is actually a picture of Singapore in haze. And this is where they usually have the national day parade. And uh, one of the ironic things is that haze usually hits during the national day season. Um, and this is something, you know, very sad in terms of national, you know, um, a national pride, you know, um, you're, not, you're not able to celebrate properly uh, because of the haze. Yeah, people are not allowed to go out and celebrate. Um, and, you know, I think even at one time F1 was called off in Singapore because of the haze. 
So for Singapore, even though they do have quite a lot of investments in Indonesia, there's been quite a bit of a change, I, I, as, as I have observed, about their national interests. So before this, you know, Singapore was very much like Malaysia as well, sort of defending their companies, you know, when they are called upon uh, for fires and all that. However, lately, Singapore has taken a different tact. I think this is very much in, uh, linked to the fact that Singapore is beginning to realize that um, even though they have interests in Indonesia, but Singapore's main national interest and priorities actually is human resource and human security because Singapore's natural resource is their population and the people who come to work in Singapore. Uh, that's their engine of growth, basically. So if people cannot go to work, which is what happens when there is haze, um, their economy will slow down dramatically. So uh, Singapore, I think, is beginning to realize that. So the human security element is much more important than, say, foreign investment or, or, or patron client relations, if you will. So as a result of this sort of shift, we see a very much more vocal um, Singaporean voice at the ASEAN level. They have pushed for more stronger efforts, like let's say open sharing of information um, and more pressure. They've also put more pressure on their own companies. One of the most notable uh, developments has been the Transboundary Haze Pollution Act that Singapore has uh, put into force in 2014. And this is an attempt to unilaterally criminalize the haze. So any entity that was found to have caused haze, uh, caused fires that produce haze that come to Singapore could technically be prosecuted under this law. Um, and this was actually, Singapore actually promoted this as within the ASEAN agreement, Transboundary Haze Pollution, because within that agreement, there was an allowance for this kind of legal measures. So they argue that we are, we are sort of doing this in line with the ASEAN agreement. However, nobody has been officially prosecuted yet, although there were some warrants being taken out um, because of various reasons. Number one, there's a difficulty to identify culprits. There's no openly available maps. Um, the smoke trajectory is also very hard to uh, really prove. Are you, is it 100% sure that this particular particle of smoke comes from a particular uh, company in, single, in Indonesia, for example? And also, most importantly, the lack of cooperation from Indonesia. Indonesia claims that Singapore is overstepping their legal boundaries. And because of that, Indonesia has not been very forthcoming with helping Singapore in their investigations. And of course, um, it doesn't help that some of the companies or the many of the companies that Singapore approached first uh, for under this law were Indonesian. So it also had a sort of a diplomatic effect over there. And in fact, there was a diplomatic tiff and um, uh, and, and there were quite a lot of words slung around between the diplomats of the two countries uh, over this. On Indonesia's side, uh, we have pres uh, President Jokowi, who is in charge now. And Jokowi actually came in uh, just before, uh, I mean, just after the, the ASEAN agreement was uh, ratified by Indonesia. And uh, perfect timing, or rather, uh, interesting timing and immediately after he came into in, into office there was a big haze uh, happening and therefore the haze kind of accidentally became a priority issue for Jokowi and so he did a lot of things for example he created the peat restoration agency um, to sort of stop fires from recurring repeatedly in the same areas he also pushed for the expedition uh, expediting of the one map to identify land ownership so there would not be something like or oh, I don't actually own this place, the fire is not actually on my land. And he also, something very interesting he did was to link fire activity to police and military KPI. So if there was fires in your land, uh, in your area, let's say the police area, um, you wouldn't get promoted, for example. So this was his effort to crack down on patronage, even though patronage is systemic, but this kind of measures hopefully would have been effective because then it would it would put into question um, the interests of the patron itself. So the patron, are they still going to protect their client if their own position is at risk? And there's also much more stricter law enforcement. Um, many companies were at last pro being properly prosecuted under Jokowi. However, Jokowi is known to be a non-ASEANist, so he was a bit reluctant to, I mean, even though uh, the agreement was ratified before he came into office, um, he has actually um, not been very eager to increase cooperation with ASEAN. And he has even told ASEAN, just leave Indonesia alone, we will do it our way. Uh, if we cannot do it, then we will call you, something like that. Um, there's also the possibility of a discontinuation of funding for the, for the uh, BRG, the Pit Restoration Agency 
linked as well partially to the COVID pressures. And also the, re the recent omnibus law, which was announced, uh, which has made it easier for corporations to access lands and which also are rolling back certain peatland protection laws. So these are all of the sort of worrying things. In Malaysia, Malaysia has sort of been in between these two positions. They are still undecided if they want to take a harder or a softer stance on transboundary haze. They kind of flip-flop in between these positions. So basically, Malaysia is similar to Indonesia in the sense that they support non-interference over effective cooperation. Uh, for example, alongside Indonesia, Malaysia did not want to refuse to openly share their maps, uh, you know, citing national security security concerns and company law concerns and all this. Um, Malaysia has also been in two minds about whether they want to propose a similar law like what in like what Singapore did. So uh, just last year, there was announced uh, they, they revived this effort. Uh, they wanted to have a Malaysian transboundary haze bill, uh, but this law would have been limited to only Malaysian interests in Singapore, in Indonesia. So the idea was that Malaysia would be able to prosecute their own companies or monitor their own companies better through this law. However, it was again uh, scrapped early this year. So it's a flip-flop as well. And you know, under the current economic transformation program, um, you know, uh, Malaysia's still pushing for more uh, palm oil expansion. And most of this is in Sarawak, which is what worrying because it's majority peatlands. So if the peat is not managed well, or rather if the peat is um, continuing business as usual, this will be very dangerous for the, for the fire and heat situation as well. So finally, what has been happening, I think, just to contextualize things in the current, uh, the current uh, era, I suppose, um, customer pushback has played a very important role um, in haze and in haze management and sustainability practices. So because people are being more aware of um, how, how peatlands and how uh, palm oil, for example, um, is being grown unsustainably, um, Com companies and customers have been pushing for more sustainable measures. And this is, of course, a good thing to the, to the um, sector because you know, palm oil, if done sustainably, is good and very important and very prosperous for the countries which grow them. So this pushback has actually made companies, uh, especially the larger companies, the very visible large companies, famous companies, um, have been sort of forced to make sustainability uh, pledges and change their practices on the ground, which is great. So we have things like the RSPO, the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil. We also have NDPE, which is no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation pledges, which is like ind independently by particular companies. So all this has been good. Uh, the included, included in this is like the non-use of fire, non-use of peat. So this is all great. Um, however, still, you know, some of these companies have been found to be non-compliant. These companies are huge, so maybe some of their subsidiaries would have been non-compliant. And even though the companies have all their SOPs, it's hard to monitor throughout the whole uh, system. So we have these uh, instances where some companies have been have been um, suspended from RSPO because certain areas were not following and were causing fires and such. Um, another issue is the medium scale companies, which are increasingly more and more nowadays, and they are not consumer fronting, they are just usually sort of buried in the supply chain. Uh, so people don't know who they are, and they're not as famous, and so they're a bit under the radar, so they have not really faced similar pressures as the large companies. So because of this, medium scale companies are quite worrying right now because their practices are, they are large enough to be, have a very big impact, but they're not large enough uh, to have this visibility. So they're in the gray area. And these mechanisms like RSPO are only now incorporating smallholders. So smallholders only now are getting involved in all of these movements towards more sustainable means, um, you know, due to various uh, reasons of sort of uh, path dependency for RSPO and such. Um, and also, you know, related political tensions like the EU Southeast Asia biofuel dispute, which I think most of you would be very well aware of uh, in Europe, um, have heightened the defensiveness in the sector. So uh, in Indonesia and in Malaysia, uh, anything sort of um, commenting on sustainability or on fires and all that is viewed with very much defensiveness and suspicion um, and sort of like a, a eco imperialism kind of a debate going on here. So this is complicating again the process towards um, sustainability in peatlands, in palm oil, and in all of these other sectors as well. 
So I think that is all that I will share for now. And I'm happy to take any more questions uh, in the next few minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Varki, for this very informative presentation. And now with that, I would like to start a question and answer session and the discussion. As I said before, it's about half an hour. And if you don't want to have your voice recorded or your face, you might as well post a question in the chat. <laughs> Anyone have a question? <laughs> Questions um, or remarks, anything. Hello, I, I, I would have directly two questions, if I may. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so thank you first for your great talk. It was, I really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Um, I would have two questions, as I said. The first is, I would uh, enjoy if you could um, dig a bit deeper into the recent attempts in Indonesia to protect peatland, how you perceive them as someone so long doing research on this. Do you see this as a kind of attempt to, let's, not similar to greenwashing, that there are now these big programs and, and there is, no, so that there is, it's seen as if there's happening, but actually practice continues as usual, or is there really a shift in, in, in um, what's done? And the second question concerns the dimension of time. Uh, I'm doing research in East Kalimantan for quite some while, and I always have the feeling that, especially on the Kabupaten level, most Bupatis think in five years terms. That's the term of their office. That's the time where they hope they can get their pockets filled. A lot of them have big debt with companies that sponsored their election campaign, so they, they think in quite short time frames. And I wonder if you, when you look at the different stakeholders involved in all these haste discussions, do you see their groups of people or individuals that try to think in the longer term, where you also from a really pure economic perspective would see that it makes sense to invest now in proper peatland protection because the, the, the social and also the health cost and the economic cost that will sum up in the end are so will or will be so incredibly high in the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, those are actually, I think I would say they are more, I mean, they are very good comments, actually, uh, for the situation. Um, maybe I'll deal with the second one first. Um, I, I, to, I, I totally agree. I think this issue of the time frames are, are, are a big problem. And this is why we see that the patronage is much more stronger at the local level um, and the Bupati level, for example. So um, definitely, they would they would be very interested in maximizing um, their returns, not only their political mileage, but also their own uh, pockets in that sense. So we have seen trends, for example, like um, uh, land, um, land categorization changing immediately after a new Bupati takes over, for example. Um, so these are, th this is a, a big problem. And also things like, because um, local, or how you say, the central authority um, does have substantial control over police and military from a central level, but at the uh, but at the local level, they cannot. They do not have control over, uh, let's say, the KPIs of the Bupati and whatnot. So, um, because of that, there's actually this sort of a gap between even though if the central level does have a more long-term serious view of the matter, um, it doesn't trickle down very well because of this. Um, I, you know, people always talk about decentralization. So the decentralization has actually made this um, very difficult to, to handle. Uh, but that being said, um, and this is, I guess, linked to your first question as well. Um, the government as well, even though they do, they have shown certain commitment on a lot more longer term and a more holistic term, for example, with having their um, peatland restoration agency. So they have this kind of efforts, which is kind of showing that they are becoming more serious uh, into managing haze, in, I mean, into managing peatlands and protection. But I think um, if you say that, uh, or the, uh, if you want to argue that it's kind of greenwashing, I, I wouldn't put, I mean, it could be, but I think that it's kind of the best that they can do for now. I think um, I could see it that way because I think the priority is actually for, for Indonesia trying to reduce the fires. And uh, even though, and so 
restoration of peatlands is something that is like sort of a low hanging fruit. So they're saying that they wanted to restore 2 million hectares uh, of peatlands under this agency. However, on the larger scale, there's so many more millions of hectares of peatlands being converted at the same time. So I think that's a disconnect there. So um, in trying to show that they are controlling the fires uh, by rewetting these areas, um, this is perhaps, a, it is a good PR exercise to show you're doing something, but at the same time, the other measures that should be in place to, to better protect, let's say protected areas, to better enforce the laws, that is not being done as effectively. So of course, there are some shortages, but there's also areas which they have been working hard on. But you know, recent developments like the omnibus law, which I, which I have discussed, it just really does show that the priorities still do remain with um, job creation, with uh, economic development, um, which, you know, sort of exploitation, right? Because uh, the priority is recovery at the moment for, for, for COVID. Um, so this is all putting sort of the environmental issues um, backwards. And this is threatening things all over again. Whatever gains which have been achieved, I think is being really threatened now. Thank you for your answer. Do we have another question? Like I said, every question is welcomed and we also have one in the chat, but I would like for Dr. Rocky to answer the voice question first and after that, I'm gonna read the question in the chat. Yes, Jutta, if you Yeah, hello everybody and hello um, Dr. Rocky. Um, very pleasure to meet you tonight. <laughs> and um, uh, now that you mentioned it, um, uh, especially the, this environmental problem, the local people, I mean, these are the people who are living in the area and they have to live with the destruction of their environment. Um, are they going against it? How aware are they um, to this destruction? Could you tell us a bit more about this, please? Mm. Um, okay, so yeah, definitely the, the local people are the ones who suffer the most uh, from this. Um, there have been quite a lot of uh, civil society movements um, to push back against, uh, you know, the lack of government uh, seriousness on haze. So the interesting thing is a lot of the government, a lot of the public, I mean, the civil society movements have sort of uh, tried to show or target the, the government's incapacity to handle this. So one of the things that happened during 2015 haze was that a civil society suit um, actually found Jokowi and his government guilty of negligence during the Hay season. So that was something quite um, revolutionary, I think. And it really shows that people are able, and uh, Indonesia is known to be quite strong in civil society. Um, and so they are able to voice out their concerns and they have been doing that. But I think the problem still lies in the fact that there's just so much um, uh, this whole patronage system and this whole systemic problems um, that, you know, whatever the civil society says, it becomes very difficult uh, for any action to be taken actually on the ground because it's so many people on so many different levels are invested in this problem in various ways. So, for example, with the suit that uh, basically Jokowi lost, um, even until today, uh, they have been delaying uh, sort of opening up information on this uh, according to the suit, lah, which is what was demanded. So even though civil society have been able to make um, strides forward, uh, but still um, there have been the sort of um, slowness in the legal system and um, sort of this uh, power differential between the, the elites and the, and the normal people, they still are problematic in, in sort of limiting the ability of the people to, to, to really respond. And um, in relation to that, I think other countries have also been quite active in civil society movements. So for example, in Singapore, especially, there have been uh, movements, uh, for example, the uh, PM Hayes is one, people movement, people's movement against Hayes. And they have been actually very important in pushing for sustainable use of palm oil. And uh, this has had impacts, I think, throughout the supply chain. Um, and this kind of stuff um, has a more positive impact, I feel, because it, it, it is productively engaging with the industries which are involved which I think would be would, would mean that the in, that the companies may be more open to this kind of uh, this kind of pushback as well compared to if it's like a civil lawsuit that 
just says that you know everything is horrible and i think also at the same time we have to remember that you know palm oil it is um it is something that uh um is very precious to the to the nations whether they like it or not and there's a very strong national attachment to it very strong pride to the to the um to these respective countries uh and um, if anyone attacks it too hard it becomes like a very defensive kind of an uh, sort of like a um uh, instant defensive approach so if you engage more productively so for example not saying that you are anti palm oil but instead pro sustainable palm oil this becomes a bit more palatable so i think this has been the thing that has been most effective especially with the large companies which have been involved in this so far Thank you very much. Okay, so now I would like to read a question from the chat, which is from Ms. Gotthard. And it's about, um, oh, it's concerning the omnibus law. Uh, is there a reaction from Singapore and Malaysia on the omnibus law since it, se since it seems to increase the haze risk? Mm, that's a good question, actually. And um, I personally have not uh, heard any direct uh, criticisms um, or, you know, um, uh, pushback from Malaysia and Singapore on this yet. I, I may have missed it. Um, but, it, but you know, this omnibus law is such a big, broad law and it covers so many things. So it's not just a particularly on haze or particularly on palm oil, for example. So I think it's going to take a lot of time for um, countries even to respond. But NGOs have responded, um, certain civil society movements have responded, and they have found, they have been worried about this in terms of how it will affect his. Um, and also, you know, in terms of ASEAN, being ASEAN neighbors, it's very unlikely that Malaysia or Singapore would actually say anything um, to condemn the law or to, con to, to bring out any concerns about the law until a haze actually happens, uh, the next big haze episode. And we don't know when that will happen. It might be next year, it might be the year after that. Um, and even then, you know, um, usually this kind of condemnations are not taken lightly by Indonesia and is usually seen as not being very ASEAN, uh, very ASEAN way. Um, so in terms of government responses, it's always been a very sensitive issue. So this is why, like I mentioned, like the earlier question as well, civil society has been very important and, and um, community and uh, uh, what do you call this, consumer pushback um, has been uh, the sort of driving factors of changing things on the ground, much more so than governments, I would say. Thank you. I think that answers the question pretty clearly, or very good, I would say. Do we have maybe someone else who has a question except for Yuta? If not, Yuta <laughs> can, might as well. Okay, Nadia. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the interesting presentation. So you, I think it was very clear that the whole haze problematic is quite complex and it transcends countries' boundaries. So I was just wondering, you as an expert, do you have an approach as to where to start to somehow change this narrative? Because it seems that since law and police don't work anymore, there doesn't seem to be a way to improve the whole situation. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, of course, very difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I think one of the rather the opportunities that exist now is with ASEAN, actually. Um, so um, ASEAN has been handling haze for so long. Uh, it's been 35 years actually since ASEAN has um, started to talk about haze and recently ASEAN has its ASEAN haze free roadmap and under that roadmap is supposed to uh, the goal is to have ASEAN be haze free by 2020 and so ASEAN is um, the, the the thing is that the the haze problem in ASEAN is actually getting worse instead of better you, we, we see now that in the Thailand and the Golden Triangle area, there is a similar but different problem in the sense that there's no peatlands there, but there's also still really bad haze there. Haze is getting worse in that area. And what that means is, and basically over there is also caused by agribusiness activities as well, burning crops. Um, and, and what that means is that more and more countries are having the haze problem as a local issue. 
So it is not just a, a, a transboundary issue anymore, but it's actually a Thai issue. It's a Laotian issue. Um, so it, it's a Cambodian issue, for example, because the fires are in their land and they're affecting their people over there. So I think the opportunity that comes with this problem becoming bigger is that more countries are being sucked into this. And I think um, the, the, the sort of power equation or the, 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 the arrangement of the con different countries in ASEAN, originally it was sort of Indonesia against all of ASEAN. But now that it has become a more larger problem and even Malaysia, we are having bigger fires in peatlands as well. Um, I think the way that ASEAN can change the narrative and say that, no, it's not you know, about us trying to force Indonesia to do something better. It's about us handling all of our fires properly together and sort of helping each other and, and, and maybe not being so um, rigid about the ASEAN way. That would actually help a lot, I think, at the moment, because I think this is what is uh, lacking. Because, I mean, one of the things that I've, I have realized in my research is that um, ASEAN way is not really a limit to behavior in ASEAN. It is more like a, it is there, but if a country feels that it is inconvenient to do so, they won't follow it. It's not really like a norm or a rule that has to be adhered to all the time. So what I have called it before is I've, I've said that countries use ASEAN way in strategic manners. If they feel that it's a strategic to do so, they will follow the ASEAN way strictly. They will say that, oh, that country is not following the ASEAN way. So when Singapore, for example, had their law, Indonesia said, oh, Singapore is not being very good, a good ASEAN neighbor because they're not being, they're not following the good neighborliness policy and they're not following the non-legalistic approach to things. But otherwise, if it's not, they will just forget about it. So I think that uh, this particular thing calls for um, sort of, um, a more loose interpretation of the ASEAN way and sort of putting all this aside. Uh, the ASEAN way has been ignored regularly on economic issues. Uh, however, this is a sensitive issue that you know people are still not willing to push the ASEAN way aside. So this is again linked to what I said earlier about ASEAN being very much about economic development. So I think the changes would have to occur, I think, um, at the ASEAN level, and this would be able to trickle down to the others. But of course, it's probably more easier said than done. Nope. No. Wait, wait. Can I? Okay, I'll just jump in. Um, okay. Thank thanks you. a lot, <laughs> Helen. Um, um, I already saw that Jutta has another question, but I would also like to motivate our co organizers to ask the question if they have one. And I just saw that uh, Dr. Pai has one. Would you like to ask your question? Thanks. Yeah, th thanks, Helena. Um, I mean, I've, I really appreciated your talk. It was very clear. And um, I, I also follow your work. So I think you've done some really good work in it, uncovering these patronage client Thank relationships. You. But um, maybe I just want to challenge some of the things you've been saying uh, to, to kind of uh, sharpen the discussion a bit. Um, isn't the 2019 forest fires and haze actually the empirical evidence that the strategies so far have been a complete failure, I mean, uh, rhetorically speaking. And isn't this connected to two things? Um, one, that the you were saying that, you know, the, the central government policies haven't been able to trickle down enough in Indonesia, but wouldn't, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that Jokowi himself has, and his administration, has very deep ties to the palm oil industry and that he's actually a client of and uh, in a patronage system with, with the palm oil industry himself. And B, uh, secondly, um, uh, how would you respond to the argument that I've made a couple of times in publications that um, the, the RSPO is, cannot deal with the, the problem of expansion and haze because it operates on a completely different scale. So the argument is that even if some of the bigger brand names say in our plantations, we're not cutting down forests because we've established them before 2005, uh, if total production, total demand and total production continues to expand, then this expansion will take place on forested, formerly forested areas. So it's isn't this a kind of, um, a big greenwashing exercise because it doesn't actually tackle the right scale in terms of regional expansion of the palm oil industry. 
Thank you very much uh, for those uh, questions. Um, yeah, maybe I'll talk about the Jokowi uh, question first. Yeah, it has been revealed during his recent campaign yeah, that it has some links to palm oil plantations as well. Um, the, the thing with Jokowi is that he has always promoted the fact that he is you know, not an elite patron in that sense. Um, and I think um, the, the policy that he has put into place kind of reflects that. But of course, when it was exposed that he was a patron and as well, and he had some links to the palm oil industry, this all came into question. And definitely, I think um, the results, the resulting fires, which we had in 2019, it kind of showed that whatever is happening, um, whatever that Jokowi has tried to do has not been as effective as it, as, as, as it, has hope, it was hoped to be. Um, but I think uh, that aside, Jokowi was probably the only prime, uh, the only president that undertook such dramatic changes when he came into office and for his, I think. So that has to be acknowledged, I believe, um, compared to, you know, SBY. Yes, SBY was a great ASEAN, ASEAN so much, but he wait, waited until the very end of his tenure to actually push through the ASEAN Hayes Agreement um, and sort of left all of this in Jokowi's lap. Um, so, I mean, there, there's of course of, of very much limitations to what Jokowi can do. For example, he also has pushed through the omnibus law. So I think he has this very difficult balance of handling both the development part of the things and you know and exploitation as a form of and as an engine of development. But at the same time, um, he has been, I think, quite genuine in the efforts of uh, going into trying to understand and break the. The, the, the sort of bonds of the very crux of the Hayes problem. But I think it's again, this sort of balance between sustainability and development, econom uh, economy and environment that I think all Sa Southeast Asian leaders have to deal with, which is what he's also um, handling now. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing for any, for any leader, I think, to handle. Um, and we, I guess we just need to see what is in store the rumor is that the, or rather the sort of announcement is that the that the peatland restoration agency is not going to be funded beyond this year, so that's going to be a concern as well. Um, this has been linked to um, the lack of funds due to COVID, so we'll see how that goes, lah. So I think, um, yeah, that's what I can say about that. The second part about RSPO um, not addressing the correct scale, yeah, that is. That is something that um, I think I would I would agree with to a certain extent, um, but I think RSPO is doing well in terms of trying to uh, limit expansion on peat. So their latest uh, their latest uh, what do you call this uh, uh, provisions is that uh, there should not be any new developments on peat, which I think is promising. The problem with peat with, with palm oil is that. Um, there, the time scale is very long. So any palm oil plantation would last or would last for at least 20, 25 years. So once you've already cleared a peatland, you are committed for that period of time, basically to that land. It's not easy to convince a company to leave um, a certain peat area or a fire prone area um, because they may have so many more years of profitability there in that area. But RSPO is, um, I think, moving well in terms of, you know, having no new plantations on peat. Um, so that is positive for haze, just in the haze context. And another thing is that, um, I mean, or rather, an, an, another problem with RSPO, which is what I alluded to earlier as well, is that the, the large companies are not so much a huge problem right now. Um, and I think RSPO has been a huge part in that. So they have been uh, very much responsible, I think even more responsible than national law in encouraging companies to be more careful about their practices. So I think if we want to see whether you know national law or ASEAN or RSPO independent or private um, initiatives has been effective, I think RSPO would have probably been the biggest role player here. So because of RSPO, because of the the consumer pressure and which is translated through this RSPO, 
um, uh, initiatives, um, they have made the larger companies uh, change some of their practices on the ground, I think. And now the minority of RSPO companies only have problems uh, with regards to fires and haze. And usually when that happens, they try to deal with it very quickly because they want to avoid the, the PR fallout to that. But RSPO is limited in the sense that they do not have the membership of the, of the mid-range companies yet. And they have also not involved smallholders in a lot of their discussions before this. So this is, I think, the limitations of RSPO. They are absent from this, this area in the industry, which is really uh, most vulnerable now. Uh, so I think RSPO has to sort of figure out a way to involve these other players as well. So this is what I will say about RSPO. Thank you. Thank you. We maybe have time for one short question. So if someone has a question, now is the time to ask because the time is sadly running out. Oh God, my laptop is doing whatever he wants. No. Okay. I don't see anyone raising their hands or neither do I see a question in my chat. Okay. Okay, so it seems we don't have any more questions. I'm, if there are no more questions, which I think is how it is right now, I would like um, to thank you again, Dr. Waki, for your presentation and you answering this, those questions. Um, would you like to say some concluding words? Mm, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for all the really great questions. And um, I think it's really interesting to engage uh, with more European scholars and people who are thinking about this, because at the same time, I'm also very much um, concerned and writing and thinking about, uh, you know, the EU Southeast Asian palm oil disputes. So um, it was really interesting to get some views uh, from you guys as well. Um, and I think uh, we are sort of uh, even though we are far away in, in physicality, but we are close through this kind of issues as well. So I think it is, this issue is close to the heart of, 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 of both of our regions. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to be here and have this conversation with you guys. So I think that's, that's it from me. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, Kali. Selamat tidur. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Selamat malam. Sudah ngantuk, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, because this is a lecture series, I would now like the moderator for next week, Ramona, to say a few words about the next presentation. Yeah, um, so next week, Mr. Gumit Singh comes to find the controversies. He is an environmentalist, social activist, and um, engineer. Um, he has, also he, he's the chairman of the Center for Environment, Technology and Development in Malaysia, and advisor of the Environmental Protection Society. So Mr. Gumit Singh is doing clean environment and human rights activism for more than over 40 years. And He's not only reminding Malaysian people to think about future generations. He comes to give us a lecture about the future of transport in Southeast Asia. And yeah, this lecture will be next week on Wednesday at the same time as tonight. And yeah, so I hope to see you there. It is great. I, I, I work with him a bit and uh, he's really inspirational. So I hope all of you will attend his lecture as well. We will. Thank you, Ramona, for the short introduction. And from my point, I would like to thank everyone again for the questions and the participation in the lecture series. And I hope everyone has a pleasant evening. And that would be it from my point. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Good night. Good night.